the church is perfectly equipped to reach a world that doesn't exist anymore. See, too many churches are using 20th century methods to reach a 21st century world. So in this video, we're going to be talking about how do you grow a church in the 21st century? Coming up. Hey, what's up y'all? My name's Chris Abbott, but all my friends just call me Abbo. And in this channel, we talk about practical ways to be able to use social media and technology in order to reach more people, increase your impact, and grow your church. So in this video specifically, we're going to be talking about how to grow a church in the 21st century. And I'm even going to share with you some strategies that I've used at my church to increase our visitors by 113% in one month. So let's dive in. Now, Tom Rayner says that not learning how to use social media effectively is like a missionary moving to a country and refusing to learn the language. So number one is learn the language of social media. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can use social media. In fact, some of my favorites are Facebook ads and Instagram ads. But the most important thing to understand is that there's 2.7 billion people on Facebook and another 1 billion people on Instagram and Facebook owns both platforms. That makes Facebook and Instagram the single largest missions field the church has ever seen. So we have to figure out how to effectively use it and look at it as a missions field, right? This isn't a social media platform. It's not a place where we can say all of our announcements or talk to people about our brand new sermon series or baptisms and baby dedications. This is a missions field and we need to show up that way. So I actually created a three-part video series about what to post on social media and Facebook. So you can check that out right up here if you wanna do an in-depth dive into exactly what to post on Facebook. Number two, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. Now, James Clear talks about this in his book, Atomic Habits, which if you haven't read it, is a phenomenal leadership book. But he talks about that if you are trying to change or you're trying to accomplish something, the problem isn't you, the problem is your systems, right? So what we wanna do, it's not enough to just make a bunch of goals and figure out that we wanna grow our church or we wanna increase our engagement online or we wanna reach more people. We have to actually have systems set up that facilitate that. So do you have a system for attracting new families or your assimilation or your discipleship or follow-up? Now, utilizing something like Plan Your Visit is a great way to create a system for attracting new visitors and taking care of them when they get there. Plan Your Visit is simply the idea of giving new guests the opportunity to sign up and schedule an appointment to visit your church. That way you can assign a friendly host to meet them at the front door, help them get their kids checked in, give them a tour of the property, maybe introduce them to some key staff and leaders, and then even sit with them in service. When we started doing this at my church, we actually increased our first time visitors by 42% in the first month, 60% in the second month, 87% in the third month, and 113% in the fourth month. I'm telling you, Plan Your Visit works and it works really, really well. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. It doesn't matter if you have a big church, a small church, if you're in the city, if you're in a small town, it doesn't matter. Plan Your Visit is universal. I've helped thousands of churches implement Plan Your Visit and it works every single time because every single person wants to make a human connection. And Plan Your Visit simply lowers the barrier of entry for someone to visit for the first time. In fact, if you're specifically trying to reach the unchurched, this is perfect because the majority of people that sign up for Plan Your Visit are actually unchurched. So many of us get caught up in how are we gonna grow our church? So we're constantly trying to figure out how do I grow my church? How do I reach more people? How do I recruit more volunteers? How do I attract new visitors? But asking how is the wrong question. The question isn't how, the question is who. Who do you need to become in order to attract new visitors, in order to grow your church, in order to increase your impact and reach more people? See, sometimes we have to actually let go of who we are now in order to make room for who we are becoming. And so if God is leading you to the next level of your leadership, you might have to leave some of those old habits and those things that you used to do behind. And that's a good thing, but it's extremely uncomfortable, right? Understand this, our brains are hardwired to reject change because it's uncomfortable, right? So what what you have to do is you have to embrace the discomfort and you have to push on anyway. So for example, if you're trying to grow your church, but you're stuck at like the 130, 140, 150 level, and you're trying to break through that 200 barrier, chances are the reason you haven't been able to break through is because you're still the primary caregiver. So you're probably doing all the hospital visits and the weddings and the funerals and the marriage counseling and the pre-marriage counseling and everything else under the sun. But if you want to break through the 200 barrier, you have to actually let go of that control and being the guy that does does all that and you have to actually raise up leaders and then trust them to be able to do a lot of the hospital visits and premarital counseling and the weddings and the funeral. In fact, I was on staff at a church a couple of years ago where the pastor came in and he actually grew the church from 175 to over 800 people in 
in only three years. And this was the number one thing that he did. When he first came in, he simply started delegating a lot of the caregiving responsibilities to other pastors on staff. Some of them were paid staff. Some of them were simply volunteer pastors that he raised up to be able to help with this. And that's why he was able to break through that 200 barrier and continue growing. It's because he had to let go of who he was before in order to make room for who he was becoming. So stop asking the question, how do I grow my church? And start asking the question, who do I need to become in order to grow my church? All right, number four, steal like an artist. Now, this is a really important caveat. Do not steal like a thief, steal like an artist, right? So Pablo Picasso said that good artists copy, great artists steal. Right now, that doesn't mean you go out there and you literally just steal another church's logo or you steal their artwork for a sermon series or something like that, right? Don't go steal their motto or anything like that. But what you want to do is take a look at what other churches are doing and then steal the idea, right? So maybe they're doing a huge series on sex and dating and they found that their attendance went way up for the month of February while they talked about sex and dating. So maybe you want to schedule a sex and dating series in February yourself. Or maybe you look and you see that there is a church that did kind of an apologetic series and ended up attracting a bunch of new visitors because people have questions about whether or not the Bible is real or why do bad things happen to good people. So then you go in there and don't take the exact name of theirs, but maybe you come up with a different title for a sermon series, but address some of the same questions. In fact, when I was in full-time ministry, one of the sermon series that I used to do was called Brainwashed. Does God really exist or are we all just brainwashed? And it was crazy. We would do it every October and we found that our attendance went up crazy every single week simply by doing this series. And I literally did it every single year, right? So all we would do is we would answer the questions, why do bad things happen to good people? How can a loving God send people to hell? Has science disproven Christianity? Can there really be just one true religion? And what is funny is I would literally just print up invite cards and hand them out all over the city with the questions that we were going to be answering. And people flock to church every single week because people want to know the answers to questions they're actually asking, right? So nobody woke up this morning and said, gosh, if I just understood why Peter dropped his nets and followed Jesus in Luke 5, right? Now I wonder that kind of stuff. You might wonder that kind of stuff, but we're nerds, right? Like we read the Bible and study all the time, but the average person doesn't even know what we're talking about, right? The average person is stressed out and can't understand why God would let their grandmother die when they were praying for healing or why they lost a family member in a car wreck, right? These are the real questions that people are asking. So if you build a sermon series around some of these questions, you're going to reach a lot of people and you're going to have a lot of new people coming in the front door. Now, before I get to my last couple of points, uh, make sure to like this video if you found it interesting and subscribe because we're putting out brand new videos every single day, five days a week. And if you hit that little bell notification, then you'll get notified every single time we drop a new video. All right, number five, dream dangerously. Now, I think it's really important to constantly be believing God for big things, impossible things, right? If you've ever read Good to Great by Jim Collins, he talks about having big, hairy, audacious goals, right? BHAGs. And I love Mark Batterson talks about in The Circle Maker about BHAPs, big, hairy, audacious prayers, right? I love this idea of praying and believing God for things that would be completely impossible outside of God, right? But the Bible says that nothing is impossible for him who believes. We want to dream dangerously, figure out some things. What are some huge things? that you can believe God for that you could never see happening in the natural. And the only way you could actually accomplish it is if God intervened. Mark Batterson said that Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. So you need to start dreaming dangerously. All right. And finally, number six, growing churches don't find great leaders they build them, right? So this is a really important point when you are trying to grow a church in the 21st century, right? We can't do things the way we always did. So a lot of times, especially if we're trying to figure out the who, not the how, right? Now we have to figure out, okay, how can we raise up leaders to be able to help us? And it's natural to start thinking, okay, like, well, who do we know? Or can we hire a really great youth pastor from another church? Or is there a worship leader out there where that, that I can hire that's just going to take everything to the next level? The reason your people aren't like the people in the churches you admire is because you haven't led them there yet. Now, I don't know about you, that stings a little bit for me, but I think it's absolutely true. Growing churches don't find great leaders, they build them, right? So who can you invest in in your church and raise up? One of the most interesting things that I've seen being in my church for as long as I have is a lot of the leaders who are now on staff and are leading our church into the next generation were kids that I had in middle school and high school and I was their youth leader, right? So it's kind of crazy. Now these guys have grown up like, they, you know, they, they work at the church, they work in the city and they, you know, they're leaders all throughout the community, right? They're married and they have kids. 
And now they're leading us into the next generation, but it's because we built these leaders, right? They've been with us for so long. We didn't go find them and hire them from other churches. We built them. Okay, so if you're looking for even more ways to how to grow your church in the 21st century, I actually put together a free PDF of 101 outreach ideas you've probably never heard of, right? So I guarantee there's going to be a ton of ideas on there you've never even thought of. So if you just click on the link in the description below, you can actually download that PDF for free and maybe see if there's some things that you can dream dangerously about. <laughs>